Okay, thank you Sandra. We'll start then. Okay. <laughs> well, morning all. And uh, as you know, I see this season as a journey across an unfamiliar landscape to a whole new future for us really, and for the church as a whole. And uh, we see our journey across this landscape being uh, guided, navigated by way markers or a cairn with stones in which tells us the important things to focus on, the directions we should go in. And of all the stones in that cairn, I think the most important one is to do with the presence of God. And I was really grateful for several people just kind of reinforcing this over recent weeks. So you remember Adam speaking about the Ark of the Covenant and how that the presence of God went with the Israelites as they came out of the Exodus, um, represented by the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence there. Do you remember the beautiful textile piece that uh, Anne Evans has created and the sense of God being with them through a pillar of fire at night and a cloud in the daytime? And that's represented by red crosses and little blue beads right across the piece that she created. And then Lydia yesterday spoke brilliantly, I thought, about uh, how the new temple would be greater than the old and about how the very new temple, the new covenant temple, which we're in, is about us together and individually being temples of the Holy Spirit and how God's presence is really what was important about the old temple as well as the new. So really grateful to Lydia yesterday for her talk from Haggai and the emphasis on the presence of God rather than the structure of the temple, which leads us brilliantly really onto our focus for the coming month or so, which is to do with the person and presence and power of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. And Adam will be speaking about that kicking off our series next, next Sunday morning. So this morning I thought I'd ask an obvious question really. And at the risk of sounding a bit like J. John, I can't really do his accent, but um, Jesus promised he would be with us always. And the obvious question is, how? Okay, how does that happen? So I want to read you one passage of scripture, refer to some others, and we're going to look a, bit, a little bit at the how Jesus is with us in our lifetime, in our life, through our life in these days. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with John 15 verses, sorry, John 14, verses 15 to 17. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. For he lives with you and will be in you. Uh, you can't get much closer than that, can you? Of Jesus being with us always through the power of the Spirit. I want to refer you now to Luke 11, verses, verses 13. Well, the, the central verse is verse, verse 13, where Jesus says to his disciples, even if you are like fathers um, and are perhaps not good, in fact, he calls them evil, know how to good, give, give good things to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven, how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And then in John 20, um, after his resurrection, when he's with the disciples, Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So that promise of receiving the Holy Spirit goes through the next few weeks with them until the day of Pentecost, when after a period of waiting, the Holy Spirit comes and they are filled with the Spirit and they go on from there. And I want to just rehearse with you briefly some of the things that went on from there because they're pretty good really and pretty exciting. So <clears throat> sometime after Pentecost, probably not long, they were hauled up, the disciples were hauled up uh, uh, by the religious leaders and questioned for what they were doing, mainly out of jealousy and out of fear I think. But when they got home, having been scolded by them, having been told off, they got home to the other disciples and they prayed and they worshipped and they asked God for boldness and they asked God that they would see people healed. And the result was that they were filled again with the Holy Spirit and the whole place shook. So first principle, being filled with the Spirit doesn't happen once. It's something that happens again and again at particular times. And we're called to be always filled with the Spirit, <coughs> as Paul points out in Ephesians. In Acts 5.2 it says, We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit 
whom God has given to those who obey him. So again, they're answering the religious leaders who have been critical. And they are saying not just us, but the Holy Spirit within us is witnessing that the things that we're talking about are true. Acts 6 verse 3, choose seven men who are full of the spirit and wisdom to be the deacons. Acts 8 verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. That was the Ethiopian eunuch. So, the Philip, so Philip was told by the spirit to do that and he does and wonderful things happen as a result. Ananias to Paul as he's receiving his sight back from God. Brother Saul and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The advantage of having a wife upstairs who can hear that my voice is croaking. Excuse me. Thanks, Kath. <clears throat> Acts 10 verse 47. This was after the house of Cornelius or in the house of Cornelius. As Peter's preaching, they clearly believe and start manifesting some of the signs of the Holy Spirit with them. So he says, can anyone prevent these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Acts 13 verse 2. This is now in Antioch when Paul and Barnabas are there. When they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, what did he say? He said, set aside for me, Paul and Barnabas, for the ministry to which I've called them. Acts 16 verse 6. This is now when Paul's on his missionary journey with some friends and they've determined that they're going to go to uh, Mycenae and Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit stops them. So the verse says, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, Asia then they come to the border of Mycenae, they try to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not let them. Isn't this an incredible, immediate kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit, with God through his Spirit? You know, it says he was told, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit kept them, the Holy Spirit filled them. Really immediate relationship, close relationship. And it is very like, because it was, someone who lives with them and will be in them. Someone who will live with us and will be in us. How were they empowered by the Holy Spirit? What is it that kept up this, this infilling, this encounter with God the Holy Spirit? I mean, at first it was after a period of waiting, as per Jesus' command, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the posture of waiting and seeking him and praying and worshipping and fasting and, and being there waiting for God to do what he promised to do. But after that, there was this ongoing life of prayer and worship together, whether it's in the upper, upper room or a team on mission. It was full of prayer and worship. It was a life which had a, an attitude of mission, of adventure, of obeying Jesus' command to take the gospel to all nations. There was a, a life which had an expectation of being led, of being empowered. There was a sense of it being immediate. We are doing this with God now. This is now that we are responding to him, listening to him, having this adventure with him. Even if at times it was frustrating because they were held up or blocked or in prison or whatever. And so they had this life of Jesus being with them always and being present through the Spirit of Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, being with them as he promised. So what about us? Is it any different? Has God changed? I think the promise still stands that we will be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that he will be with us. He will live with us and be within us, be with us. The experience awaits if we've not had it. These days are no different in terms of what God is doing. His power has not changed. His ability to be close to us, his desire to be with us and in us has not changed at all. We need to move to where he is rather than expecting him to bend to our expectations or lack of it. And my experience being filled with the Spirit is something that happens initially in a kind of a quiet way or maybe a spectacular way but then needs to be repeated and initially it's about believing the scriptures that he will be good to his promise and will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. It is sometimes about waiting, certainly about asking, about seeking, about praying, maybe about fasting. In my own experience when I was a teenager, I think I was 18 at the time, I was desperate for an experience of God far more powerfully than I'd had up until that point. And I, and I prayed, I think, for about nine months and waited. And finally I got to, I think it was uh, Good Friday, 
This was 1975, if I'm right. And uh, I fasted for the first time and sought God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the next day I was listening to this cassette. Some of you may remember cassettes. Do you remember cassettes? I was listening to this tape from Post Green, a, a wonderful Christian community in, in Dorset, where they were speaking about this new experience of being baptised in the Holy Spirit and the gifts that the Holy Spirit could bring. And I found myself praying in another language, just spontaneous. I asked God and went for it in an 18-year-old kind of fashion. But it was after a time of waiting and after a time of seeking and asking and being desperate really for an experience of God and after a time of, in faith, launching out and praying in another language and feeling God's presence with me. And, and life began to really change at that point, all sorts of things. My first experience actually was of him healing me of something deep inside that I didn't even know was there. So that's the start of this. But then constantly, it's something that we need to renew. We need to fan into flame, as Paul says, the gift that God has given us, the gift of the Spirit. We use, need to use the gifts of the Spirit that God has given us and not let them atrophy, not let them lie waste. We need to constantly have prayer and worship in our lives and a rhythm as they did in the early church. We need to focus on mission as they did because that's what the Spirit was given for, that the world might believe Jesus and be pointed to him. We need to sing. We need to read and believe our scriptures. We need to have communion regularly as we are. We need to fast and pray and expect and wait and have faith and exercise faith in community as well as on our own. And Jesus will be good to his promise that he lives with us and will be in us. And our experience of him today will be and can be as immediate as, our, as their experience was then. And it could begin today, this Monday morning, the uh, 8th, I think, of June, 2020. So let's go. Let's do it. Why not? Now, some of you may never have had an experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. For others, it's something that you've lived with for many years. But wherever our starting point, let's go for it today or recommit to it today to have a life that is filled by the Spirit of God. Now, some of you will immediately think you'll have a delaying voice in your head, won't you? Right now. You'll have some rational, rational idea as to why this can't be right or why it can't happen. You'll argue with yourself. Some of you will feel you're not good enough. Some of you will be afraid. But this is Jesus we're talking about. It's the Father, Jesus' his Father, who pours out his Holy Spirit on his children. It's the Spirit of Jesus we're receiving. It's not safe, but it's good. The Holy Spirit transforms our lives to be effective in his hands, and he will lead us into all sorts of adventures, and that's right and good. But let's not deny him that privilege. Let's not be disobedient. Let's be open to being filled again. So I want to pray and worship a bit now and invite you to join me. We're going to sing a very simple doxology, which is about praising the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in that time, I want you to ask again to be filled with the Spirit of God. And I will believe, and I'm believing that you will be, that we will be, that this day will be different, that we, we, there will be adventures, there will be a voice of God pointing us in this way or that, not just for now, but for the months that lie ahead. So we're going to sing praise to the Father, praise to the Son, praise to the Spirit, to God, three in one. Okay? It goes like this. Praise to the Praise to the Spirit, to God, three in one. Let's sing that. Praise to the Father, praise to the Son, praise to the Spirit, to God. us again by your Holy Spirit this day for the first time for some or again and again for others that we experienced you before but Lord we want we 
believe that you'll be true to your promise, that you live with us and you'll be in us, in and by the power of your Spirit, whom we love like we love you and the Father. So come, Lord, come. Holy Spirit, come like the flame. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Praise to the Father and praise. Let's have a day where God is immediate to us, where he's right with us and in us, and take the adventure that he sends. Thanks, God. Thanks for being together. See you.